Hey guys, welcome back! Whenever a manufacturer releases a piece of hardware, theoretical maximum capabilities are soon explained, but some coders just don't respect conventional theories and drive exceptional performance from their host platforms. Let's take a look at notable examples from 20 of the most influential machines. On a system that was strictly limited to grey and black character graphics, Malcolm Evans managed to convey a sense of sheer terror by creating a gigantic Tyrannosaurus and having it chase you around a first-person maze. With just three characters, a fully black block, a fully grey block and a cross-shaded block, a network of 3D corridors was brought to life on a system that was barely capable of drawing a character without pausing for thought. The responsive movement and surprisingly convincing dinosaur animation were all the more impressive for the limits of the hardware too. This positively shamed the space games that appeared on just about every competing platform of the time, with visuals that look like they should be impossible on 70s technology. However, it's the sheer complexity of Solaris that is most astonishing. As well as the main pseudo 3D flight scene with distinct backgrounds and missions. There's a radar at the bottom of the screen and a star map to browse. All of that is simply incredible, considering that the Atari 2600 was designed around games like Pong and Tank. Sylvester Stallone's movie might not have broken new ground, but the Spectrum game did, thanks to the talents of Jonathan Joffa Smith. A stunning scrolling routine was developed for Cobra by the amazing Joffa Smith, indeed. Screens could be packed with well-animated sprites without a hint of flicker or slowdown. And a superb use of color, avoiding the lazy and dreary two-tone look. Joffa's slick technical skills meant that his arcade conversions such as Hypersports, Green Beret and Mickey also looked incredibly impressive. In the arcades, Space Harrier chucked massive sprites all over the place at lightning quick speed and without a hint of struggle. The master system can't match the speed of the arcade game, obviously, but you'll notice that the sprite flickering that plagues many games on the system is completely absent, despite the fact that each object is huge. How is this possible? The solution comes with the use of background tiles. You can draw these without penalty, meaning that no matter how many enemies and objects show up on the screen, nothing disappears. Of course, this approach comes with caveats. The use of background tiles means that objects have to move at least 8 pixels at a time, and of course, they can't overlap each other like sprites can, leading to the blocky border effect around each of the sprites here. This arcade conversion proves that with the proper attention from coders, the Amstrad was amazing. Mode Zero graphics show off the Amstrad's superior color handling ability. It retains all the action of the arcade game, including jumps, turbo boosts, road forks and obstacles. A good sensation of speed is retained and object scaling is handled excellently. The game even retains digitized sound effects and speech from the arcade version. Indeed! Go, Mr. Driver. When Sunsoft wanted to create a platformer to rival Super Famicom games, it didn't just throw a few resources at the project. It chucked everything it could at Nintendo's 8-bit platform, including a brand new Sunsoft 5-bit chip. 
The hardware in question was based on the FME7, which allowed for lots of bank switching fun already, but added a whole new audio chip in the form of the Yamaha YM2149F. Not only does the game look great, it sounds unlike anything else on the console. In fact, the music far closer to 16-bit chip tunes. Jack Tremiel's 16-bit computer might not have been designed for 3D games, but you'd never have guessed it when looking at Thalion's work. No second prize originated in 1989, when the German software house created an astonishingly fast 3D routine, and by early 1990 it had taken the form of a futuristic racing game that was advanced enough to show off in Ace. However, a series of changes requested by Thalion's management eventually turned the game into a rather more straightforward motorcycle racer. Whether or not as a result of that reduced scope, no second prize runs at an astonishing speed and frame rate for a 3D game on any 16-bit platform. Fully polygonal scenery and racers positively zoom past you, and it remains a rare early example of 3D gaming where the visual technology stands the test of time. While it's also on the Amiga, the ST version is the one to get. Between being the lead platform and the ST's natural advantage in 3D games, it'll maintain a higher frame rate when stressed. Hank Nieborg's 2D artwork is always a joy to behold, and Thalion's programming know-how allowed the Amiga 500 to disregard the limits of the chipset and display stunning colorful images. Lionheart's sprite animation is also fantastic. Here's how the game stack up against the theoretical maximum color output of its contemporaries. The Atari ST 16 colors, the Amiga 500 32 colors, the Mega Drive 64 colors, Lionheart 186 colors, and the Super Nintendo 256 colors. Yeah. For a C64 owner in the 90s, it was easy to be jealous of the slick action of console platform games. In an era when Sonic and Mario ruled, every format needed its own take on the formula, but Steve and John Rowland didn't just ape the style, they managed to coax that same performance out of the aging 8-bit machine. The dinosaur could run at an incredible pace, and the coders exploited a bug to achieve smooth full-screen scrolling that never struggled to keep up. Even with Parallax, the game also deployed every color a C64 could display, plus a few that were outside of its remit. How good did Donkey Kong Country look on release? So good that people didn't believe it was running on a Super Nintendo. After all, detailed 3D characters were running around against detailed 3D backgrounds. How could it be? These days we know that it was pre-rendered, but it's still a staggering achievement. For a start, Rare didn't use any extra chips. And even when you discount the Super FX, lots of Super Nintendo games did. Super Mario Kart, Street Fighter Alpha 2 and more all did so. What's more, the developer had to construct scenes carefully, with a maximum of 16 colors per tile, too much detail would result in muddy and indistinct images. Plus, considering all of the unique backgrounds and animation in the game, you'd think it would be a huge cartridge, but Rare managed to fit it into 32 megabits, which isn't nearly the largest commercial Super Nintendo release.
When the Cotton series switched from horizontally scrolling action to Space Harrier style 3D shooting, the Mega Drive might not have seemed like the ideal platform for the job. After all, it has no sprite scaling abilities. Panorama Cotton's routine to handle this was surprisingly good. But that wasn't all that was impressive about this 16-bit blaster. Success pulled off all sorts of tricks to convey a convincing 3D effect. Road effects were abused heavily. They were drawn both above and below the character for indoor tunnels and ramps could even come off these in order to simulate multiple levels of action. Standard 2D backgrounds with parallax were used to show off lateral movement and big background shifts occurred multiple times per stage. If you know anything about the Saturn's capabilities, you probably know that it's not great at 3D games. Sonic Team will have known that too. But as a team that rarely had much regard for the theoretical capabilities of Sega's consoles, it went all out for Burning Rangers to give the Saturn a pretty spectacular send-off. This firefighting game displays vast, fully textured 3D environments that stretch the VDP-1 polygon generator to its limit, quite literally, as it visibly struggles to keep everything together and uses the VDP-2 to generate truly transparent, but with low resolution objects including flames, water, windows and light shafts. What's more, a dynamic lighting effect rarely seen on the Saturn allows for torchlit sections and spectacular fires. Tillis, there's a large energy reading in your area. If you've ever wondered how so much fit into a single Game Boy cartridge, thank the late Satoru Iwata. His graphical compression technology allowed for the following. Over 250 creatures can be battled, caught, raised and traded. As well as a whole new world with its own cities, it includes the original Kanto region. The game foregoes the extra RAM of the Game Boy Color for monochrome compatibility and the Japanese version used an 8 megabit cartridge, the same size as Pokemon Yellow. The original Gran Turismo had been developed using Sony's Performance Analyzer and according to Polyphony Digital's Kazunori Yamashi, the realistic racer was only using 75% of the PlayStation's full potential. The sequel set about utilizing the remaining untapped potential and had some success, but ended up showcasing the limitations of CD-ROM technology more than anything else. The sheer amount of content in the game signposted the impending need for bigger discs. Treasure is a developer known for its technical wizardry. After all, this is a team that made waves with crazy scaling effects in Gunstar Heroes. However, its first two Nintendo 64 games didn't live up to that reputation. Mischief Makers and Bangayo were both very good games, but people had hoped to see Treasure deliver a blowout 3D extravaganza. In the end, the team didn't disappoint. Sin and Punishment never left the Japanese market, but the game became renowned for its stunning visual prowess. The Cabal-style shooter was fast and smooth, but also vastly detailed. The artists had to strike a balance between model complexity and texture usage, because the machine was prone to slowing down when overloaded. When the final results were achieved, even Nintendo's producer Itoshi Yamagami wondered how it was even possible on the Nintendo 64. What the? All fighters break apart. Who needs Dark Souls? From has been impressive from years now. 
the Xbox's main technical issue was a low pixel fill rate, leaving little overhead for special visual effects after drawing a scene. An astonishing translucent trail of light follows the arc of your weapon after every swing. Sparks fly. Enemies shatter into particles and radiate light as they are defeated, creating a stunning display of virtual pyrotechnics. Each stage is filled with destructible objects, allowing you to smash down the scenery as you take out enemies. F-Zero X was a game of compromises. It ran at a smooth 60 frames per second and was fast, but you could see where that impacted the rest of development. Crafts were basic and trackside detail was minimal. It was beautiful in motion, but still screenshots were unconvincing. The GameCube follow-up F-Zero GX had no such trouble. Somehow, Sega's Amusement Vision team ensured that not only did the game run at 60 frames per second, but that not a single corner was cut with the look of the game. Detailed textures and complex 3D models meant that the game looked immaculate at all times. We can only guess at how quickly data was being shifted around the GameCube, and we can only imagine that it's pretty close to the breaking point. Nintendo delivers a powerful 2D handheld, but awkward coders try to make 3D games. <laughs> Here's a racer that actually succeeded. Unlike other GBA 3D games, resolution and frame rate are not compromised. The core team consists of just two people, Fernando Velez and Guillaume Dubail. It's a fully textured 3D driving game on the Game Boy Advance, a conversion of a PlayStation 2 game with surprisingly similar results. When you play Fumitu Ueda's giant slaying game, you'll notice that it's among the most beautiful games on the system, but also one of the most technically demanding. The PS2 struggles to cope with it and often fails to hold a consistent frame rate. What's Shadow of the Colossus doing to cause so much strain? Firstly, it's unusual among PS2 games in that it relies heavily on texture mapping to create detail on the enemies. And with only 4 MB of video RAM, one of the PS2's biggest technical deficiencies was handling texture maps. Shadow of the Colossus makes economical use of the limited memory by using low-color textures and repeating them when it can. Of course, that's not the only factor, as you may suspect. The huge models and open environments needed to accommodate them also tax the prowess of the console. This late Dreamcast game shows a glimpse of what its later games could have looked like high-resolution textures and detailed 3D models running at 60 frames per second, explosions featuring sparks, particle effects and multiple dynamic smoke trails. The explosions even have their own physics, with the force of each blast affecting nearby trees and smoke. Other amazing effects include the likes of real-time reflections and weather. And it was eventually ported to the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 with the same models and textures. If you've enjoyed this video, consider supporting the channel monetarily through Patreon at patreon.com slash it's a pixel thing or using the thanks button below. To keep up with what's going on with the channel, check all my social media stuff by clicking on the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!